All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's McEwen Celebrates Month of Scholarship presentation. My name is Joanne Meineker. I'm Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Arts and Science, and I am pleased to be your moderator for the event. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honor and respect the history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who call this territory home. The First Peoples' connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. Today, we are joined by Dr. Leah Flaherty for a presentation called Exploiting Basic Beetle Biology to Predict, Prevent, and Detect Forest Insect Invasions. Dr. Leah Flaherty is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at McEwen and has been here since 2014. She did her graduate work and a postdoc on the East Coast at the University of New Brunswick and the University of Massachusetts, respectively. Leah's area of expertise is in the area of forest insect ecology and management. Now, I hope that you will have questions. I'd ask that you put them into the chat on the right-hand bottom side of your screen, and I'll have um, Dr. Flaherty address them at the end of the presentation. So, welcome, Dr. Flaherty. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so, th and thanks everybody for coming. I know you're all busy grading, and I and I appreciate you all attending. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that that I didn't do very much of this work during the pandemic. Okay, so like many of you, I've had um, caregiving responsibilities, and and. Um, and it has affected my productivity. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to acknowledge that, that most of this work was done pre-pandemic. Um, and I hope there's an effort um, within our institution and across academia to kind of address that disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on, on individuals in academia and elsewhere. Um, so, okay, so to my talk, um, I'm going to admit right off the bat that when I submitted my title for this talk, I wasn't completely sure what I'd talk about, so I erred on the side of the general coming up with this talk title, Exploiting Basic Beetle Biology to Predict, Prevent, and Detect Forest Insect Invasions. Um, but I decided to focus a bit in on the work that I've done specifically emphasizing how we can improve early detection of forest insect invasions. And so early detection is really going to be the focus of this talk. I also wanted to highlight right off the bat um, th that the work I'm going to talk about today is highly collaborative. It involved many McEwen students in a variety of capacities. Um, my co-PI on this work is Dr. John Sweeney from um, the Atlantic Forestry Center in Fredericton. Um, but there's a number of other collaborators, both from the Atlantic Forestry Center in Fredericton and the Northern Forestry Center in Edmonton, both part of um, Natural Resources Canada. Um, and we also had some international collaborators, including Dr. Zmachitsky from the Warsaw University of Life Sciences and Dr. Gatowski from um, the Forest Research Institute in Poland. <clears throat> so um, this slide serves as an outline, but really it's framed in the context of, of some guiding questions um, for the audience. Um, we're, I'm going to start off just by addressing some semantics and definitions, um, de comparing sort of invasion, uh, invasive species to native and non-native species, um, and then talk about why my target tax are the specimens of interest for this study, bark and wood boring beetles are problematic, and why early detection in the context of invasions is so important. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about how we can exploit some what I call bits or basic beetle biology to help us in early detection efforts. Um, and then finally, um, what we can take from this to recommend sort of, for sort of on the ground operationally um, in biosurveillance programs. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with a discussion of the of the terms non-native, native species, and invasive species. 
because the usage of these terms are, are controversial. Um, I won't get too far into that discussion, but it's important in the context of this presentation to understand um, what I mean when I do distinguish between native species and non-natives as well as invasives. Um, so as you guys likely understand, the physical or topographical features of Earth can act as barriers to the movement of organisms. And this has contributed to geographic isolation both between and within species, um, and ultimately to speciation over evolutionary time. And so these geographically separated species evolve in a particular context, uh, environmental context, and this de defines their normal um, or native geographic range. So when individuals of a species are moved outside this normal geographic range, usually aided by humans, they're considered a non-native species within that recipient region. But um, I'll admit here there's considerable ambiguity about what, what constitutes a normal geographic range over space and time, which is kind of another argument, <laughs> mostly amongst experts. Um, but, but not all non-native species introduced to an area cause harm. And in fact, relatively few do. Um, many non-natives fail, fail to establish after in, in, they're introduced. And of those that do establish, many are not noticed, go undetected, or don't cause damage. But of course, some do um, successfully establish, spread, and, and cause harm, um, which you know, involves some human valuation there. Uh, but but these are really the the individuals that I or the species that I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, there's lots of way to there's lots of different ways to kind of quantify this harm, ecological, socioeconomic, um, or financial. And just focusing on sort of financial impact um, estimates of associated with invasions in um, North America exceeds seventy billion dollars annually. And in particular, of course, uh, as Joanne mentioned, I'm a forest insect ecologist, so I want to talk about forest insect invasions, of course. Um, and unfortunately, introductions of non-natives and invasive forest insects are not uncommon. So, for example, in this Occam et al. paper in 2010, they suggest that in the United States, on average, about two and a half non-native species or between two and three non-native species, um, on average, are introduced to the United States every year. And although many of these will not become problematic, it still translates to um, about one high impact forest pest being introduced every two years. And so you may or may not have noticed that all of my insect images so far were beetles. And um, in fact, they were all a particular kind of, well, a, a couple of different groups of beetles that um, can generally be called bark and wood borers. <laughs> um, so bark and wood boring insects such as um, bark beetles shown here, longhorn wood borers shown here, and jewel beetles um, are especially problematic as non-native species. And uh, in fact, over 50% of U.S. forest pest detections since 1980 were bark and wood boring beetles. Um, and this is partly due to their crypt cryptic habits um, developing um, under the bark of trees or, or even right into the wood, um, which makes them difficult to detect and intercept um, in international trade. Um, but even further, solid wood packaging, like you can see here, um, is commonly used in international trade um, and a really common pathway for these taxa to be introduced. And there has been some improvements uh, in terms of regulations associated with international trade, for example, um, involving heat treatment or fumigation of all solid wood packaging material. Um, that was in 2006 that that was implemented. Um, but unfortunately, introductions of bark and wood boring um, insects internationally continue. And um, bark and wood borers of, of you know, quarantine significance continue to be introduced um, almost every year. And so this is the group that I'm going to focus on in this study. So from these three taxa or bark and wood boring beetles. So the impact of non-native bark and wood borers can be really dramatic. And I'm going to discuss a particularly devastating example of this. So this critter is an emer emerald ash borer. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, a stunning little jewel beetle um, with devastating impacts. So the photo on the left here shows a before and an after. 
of the kind of damage caused by emerald ash borer when they encounter North American species of ash, okay, in the Fraxinus genus. So typically after emerald ash borer is detected in, in, a, in an urban center, it takes about five or six years for ash mortality to exceed 95%. So that this is just three years after it was initially detected. Um, all of the ash trees in this particular street were dead. Um, so unfortunately, the species of ash that are susceptible to emerald ash borer are very common in cities across North America, including Edmonton. So Edmonton's boulevard trees are about 60% green ash, a highly susceptible species. Um, so also devastating ecological impacts in areas where ash are native in the forest, which is not the case here in Alberta. Um, but there is the concern that ash, there's a real chance that ash could become sort of functionally extirpated in, in North America because of emerald ash borer. Um, so, so luckily we don't have this species in, in Alberta yet. Um, this map shows its current range in North America as of January 2021. Um, it was ori originally introduced in Michigan in 2002, um, likely via a wood packaging material because was, this was before the heat treatment and fumigation regulations. Um, but yeah, it spread significantly, obviously, since then and was actually like while it was detected in 2002, it likely was introduced in the 1990s. Um, so in Canada, there's populations in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, and one in Winnipeg in Manitoba. One of the challenges with this species is that it's very difficult to detect um, at the onset of the infestation or in areas where it's been recently introduced, which makes it particularly hard to manage. And often once a population has reached a size where it's detectable, it's it's too late it, and all of the ash trees are likely going to, to die within a decade. Although there definitely have been some advancements in early detection and the response to, to slow that process. Okay, but I really wanna focus in here on early detection because it's critical for emerald ash borer, but it's uh, critical you know, for invasions in general. Now, obviously prevention is ideal, um, but not always possible. And so introductions of exotic bark and wood borers um, continue to occur. Uh, early detection is so important because it improves outcomes. It reduces ecological and economic damage associated with the invader, um, reduces overall management costs, um, but it also improves the likelihood of eradication or containment. So you can see in this graph here, kind of over time, costs associated, um, with a beetle as populations increase. And there's there's basically a threshold population level early on where if you catch it early enough, you might be able to eradicate it, that is um, get rid of it entirely from an area, make it go locally extinct um, or contain it from spreading. But, you know, if it's detected too late, um, early or eradication and containment is no longer feasible. And so you have to instead result to sort of long-term control and just kind of living with it and trying to mitigate the impacts. So early detection really critical and, um, and means you can have a rapid response. And, you know, there has been some cases of bark or wood borers being successfully eradicated when detected early. Um, so for example, Asian longhorn beetle um, has been eradicated twice from Canada, originally detected in 2003, declared eradicated in 2013. Another, another new introduction um, was detected, but then declared eradicated um, just last year. Um, so some good news stories. Um, so I'm, I'm acknowledging that I've painted kind of a gloomy picture so far about invasive species, um, but of course the theme of this webinar is about resilience and recovery. Um, and so the good news is that we can we can exploit some bits of basic biology to help us prevent, detect, and respond to these invasions. Um, and I'm mainly going to talk about early detection, um, but I'll mention a bit about um, prevention and, and response as well. So things like how these beetles find mates and find food in particular are often useful in the context of, of biosurveillance or, or early detection of non-native and potentially invasive species. 
Um, and while this is in many ways an applied talk, I hope that this demonstrates why, you know, basic ecological studies are really important, both because they're interesting and, um, you know, a novel in their own right, but also because knowing about the basic biology can also help us in an applied context. So one bit of beetle biology that we understand quite a bit about that can help us in early detection is olfaction or smell. And so when we understand how these insects find food and find mates via olfaction, we can exploit this. So in particular, their production and perception of sex pheromones, as well as their perception of host volatiles or what their host plant smells like, um, that is chemical, volatile chemical cues can be really useful. We can also consider the three-dimensional context um, or the three-dimensional space that these insects occupy in forests. And so we understand that forests are not homogeneous in three-dimensional space, uh, but we're really only beginning to understand how bark and wood borers and forest insects in general use this space and how we can exploit it in the context of our biosurveillance or early detection efforts. Um, we can consider both vertical and um, horizontal distribution. And so just as an example, um, one of my collaborators on this work in 2020 published a paper showing how the horizontal placement of, of traps or, or um, survey methods for non-native bark and wood borers can be, can be really important. So they surveyed um, or they looked at the impact of um, early detection traps on, in forest interiors versus edges versus open areas. Um, and ultimately found that you know, certain species were more likely to be detected uh, at different places along this horizontal gradient. And so ultimately um, concluded that, um, that these efforts should, should focus on sort of multiple locations in order to, to detect the greatest number of, of species. And then finally, visual cues can also be important characteristics of these beetles that can be exploited for biosurveillance. Um, again, especially as they relate to how beetles find their, their host trees, their food and their mates. Um, so things like the silhouette and color of the traps used in early detection can be important. So this is a 12 funnel lingering trap common in, in early in biosurveillance surveys um, because the silhouette and the color resembles the, the trunk of trees. Um, they're attractive to bark and wood borers, um, but there are other species um, that prefer other colors or other silhouettes. Um, emerald ash borer, for example, tends to prefer green and purple traps. Um, and then visual mating related cues, so we can use dead cons conspecifics or dead potential mates um, that can be used as, as visual decoys and can help um, early detection efforts, some evidence that it might be useful for EAB, but not particularly, not particularly common and certainly not as powerful as olfactory cues. Okay, so today I'm going to focus on some specific work that myself and my collabor collaborators have been doing with respect to improving early detection um, by manipulating olfactory cues and, um, and looking at spatial distribution. So, uh, so nothing on, on uh, visual cues in this particular study. Um, so a bit of background to set up the experiments that I want to describe to you. Um, until recently, early detection of, of non-native bark and wood borers in North America relied on trapping surveys mainly using host plant volatiles or, or compounds that smelled like stressed trees. Um, and one of these common ones is, is just ethanol. These Plant volatiles like ethanol attract a really broad range of bark and wood borers, um, but which is a good thing. But unfortunately, they have a, a relatively low um, or uncertain sensitivity of detecting um, longhorn wood borers in particular, as well as jewel beetles at low population densities. Um, and so, yeah, so that so that's problematic. They're they're low. Uh, detection sensitivity sensitivity at low population or small population densities. And these standard traps sort of historically were placed in the understory of canopies as well. And this, you know, this technique has certainly been useful in some contexts. It provided um, important first records of, of newly introduced species, but have also missed um, several species that went on to become really problematic invaders like emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. So definitely room for improvement. 
Um, in the last couple of decades, there's been an enormous amount of progress um, into in research related to the chemical ecology of, of the longhorn beetles or cerambicids for those of you who are entomologists out there. Um, and long distance aggregation or sex pheromones um, have been identified in well over 100 species now, I've kind of lost count. Um, but these pheromones have an awesome potential for use in biosurveillance for a few reasons. Um, the first is that the chemical structure of these pheromones are highly conserved evolutionarily. So a relatively small number of compounds attract um, a large number of species across genera, across subfamilies, and even across continents. Um, they also appear to have greater sensitivity of detecting longhorn beetles at low population densities, at least compared to host volatiles. And so, um, yeah, so that makes them really good candidates for use in biosurveillance. Um, and in the last couple of years, some of these pheromones are beginning to be incorporated into biosurveillance programs, um, but lots of work remains to optimize their use. And we're also beginning to understand that there's, you know, vertical stratification in forests in, in terms of how these um, insects utilize the forest and we might be able to exploit that for, for detection. And so um, that's something that we wanted to explore in our study as well. And yeah, so here's an example of um, sort of the standard understory trap. And then eventually we, I'll get to where we um, ran an experiment comparing canopy traps that's circled here to these understory traps. Okay, and so over the past seven years since I've been at McEwen, um, with a couple of years off from maternity leaves, um, I've been collaborating on several projects generally aimed at improving techniques for early detection of bark and wood borers. Um, and so as I previously mentioned, we're comparing understory to canopy traps. Um, but we're also looking at olfactory cues. And so um, we've been comparing the standard host volatile lures, so, so baiting traps with, with chemicals that just smell like trees, especially sick trees or weakened trees. And we've been comparing those to what we call pheromone enhanced super lures. Um, so, so basically we wanted to see if the addition of these longhorn beetle pheromones um, improve our ability to detect a wide variety of, um, of species that, uh, you know, if non-native could potentially become invasive. Um, but then in subsequent experiments, we tweak these pheromone enhanced lures to compare different blends, um, especially reduced component blends. And I'll get to why we did that in a second. Um, also some experiments looking at release rates of semi chemicals in lures or, or of the compounds in lures, because that can, can actually, like how much of the compound is released um, per unit time can actually be important in, in terms of whether or not it's going to elicit a response from the beetle. Um, we've also compared different trap types, um, for example, comparing, this is our 12 funnel lingering because it has 12 funnels. <laughs> we compared it to a four funnel, which is just oper like operational. Um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency typically use 12 funnels, but they're, you know, a little cumbersome and, and expensive. So we wanted to compare it to a smaller design. And we also have looked at um, whether or not we could use trap trees, so artificially stressing trees and using them kind of as sentinel traps um, as a tool in, in early detection. Um, yeah, but for the remainder of the presentation today, I'm gonna really focus in here on these three items um, highlighted in red here. So comparing like vertical stratification and then also comparing um, different pheromone enhanced lure blends as well as um, how that relates to the performance of traps baited with just the host volatiles. So um, I want to describe the results of, of two experiments that we ran in, in some detail. Um, where we evaluated the impact of our of our canopy and our understory traps. And for those of you who may be interested, we were able to get traps into mature trees. Well, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Um, using this large, a big shot slingshot, about eight feet long, and you shoot a line over a branch, um, and then you hoist the trap up um, into the canopy. Um, and so, yeah, so in both experiments, we we compared canopy to understory traps, and we 
but we compared different lure types. So in experiment one here in the top, we compared three different lure types. And really we, we wanted to compare the standard kind of host volatile lure to these pheromone enhanced super lure blends. One which was designed as um, a, a super lure uh, for hard for beetles infesting hardwoods, and one as a super lure for beating beetles infesting softwoods. Um, but designing these lure blends is actually quite tricky, and because of the potential for antagonism um, between lure components, um, we we wanted to reduce the number of components in experiment number two. So that is, while a particular compound might be attractive to a given species on its own, if you add other compounds or other pheromones, um, it may ultimately de deter a species from moving towards a, a lure or a trap. And so the chances of this happening can increase with an increasing number of different components in one lure blend. And so in this second experiment, we wanted to compare some reduced component blends um, with fewer components to prevent antagonisms, but also a uh, reduced cost because each component um, is quite expensive. And, and since we want them to be able to be used operationally um, by agencies like the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, reducing the cost is, is definitely a consideration. Um, yeah, so you can see the different abbreviations I use for the different lure types and just kind of generally what it means. Um, but I will, I'll head into a little bit more detail. I hummed and hawed about whether to include this, but um, here's a list of the different compounds used in the lures. Um, probably doesn't mean all that much to you, but, but I really want to hone in here to indicate their, their kind of ecological significance. So I've indicated here which compounds were used in which um, experiments um, with each sort of lure treatment but then also their ecological significance over here. So we needed to identify the best candidate sex pheromones from previous research and published literature. And for our, our super lure blends, we selected the, the longhorn sex pheromones that were the most conserved across, across species, um, but also a mix of pheromone motifs so we could get species from a wide variety of, uh, of taxa. And so the best candidates for longhorn pheromones are shown here in blue, also bark beetle pheromones um, in, in a couple of our blends, and then host volatile lures down here. So those were the three kind of ecological components of, of our blends. Okay, so going back to our main design, so you understand how this experiment worked. Um, each experiment was replicated at two locations. So experiment one in, in here in Edmonton and in Nova Scotia and experiment two in New Brunswick and Poland. So obviously relied a lot on collaborators for that. Um, and so in all cases, uh, you know, we set up our traps. You have to service them every couple of weeks, collect the beetles that they catch. Um, and sort them, pin them, identify them, and voucher them. And the ones that we collect in Edmonton are, are vouchered at the Northern Forestry Center's collection. Okay, so what did we catch? We caught a lot. Uh, we caught over 38,000 target specimens of bark and wood boring beetles that were, you know, identified <laughs> painstakingly, um, made up of 189 species, 18 Eupressidae, which is our jewel beetles, 101 species of cerambicids or, or longhorn wood boring beetles, and, and 70 scolitids or bark beetles um, across eight subfamilies. And um, we actually ended up having some new species records for Canada, Alberta, and the Maritimes. Um, and one bark beetle caught in Nova Scotia is, yeah, it's a new record for Canada, as well as another beetle, which was a new record for Alberta. And here's um, some of our Edmonton crew uh, for one of the years of our experiments, um, including three McEwen students and, and Greg Pohl from the Northern Forestry Center, who is our, um, helped us a lot in um, experimental setup as well as identification. Okay, so how did we evaluate you know, trap trap or treatment performance. Um, we used a variety of metrics um, to, to look at our different treatments. Um, first is species richness. So we assume that treatments that detected the greatest number of target bark and wood borer species at a given site would also be more likely to detect newly introduced species of similar taxa. And this is an important assumption, but 
Also, the inclusion of the European site in experiment number two also allowed us to evaluate the efficacy of our treatments for detecting European species that, that could be introduced to North America. We also evaluated mean catch per trap or abundance of a given species, um, detection rate of a given species, so the proportion of traps that caught at least one specimen of a species. Um, we also did some multivariate analyses, um, so some ordinations, which basically allow us to evaluate whether or not our different treatments are trapping different assemblages of beetles, different species assemblages. And then finally, rarefaction, which are essentially species accumulation curves, um, allowing us to evaluate how many traps are needed at a site to detect um, a large proportion of the, the community or the species that are actually there. All right, um, hopefully everybody's still with me. This, um, this first result slide shows um, our species richness results for experiment one. And basically, um, well, we saw some variation between locations and taxa, but generally what we saw is that more species were, um, were detected using our pheromone enhanced blends. So that these are our gray bars compared to just our host volatile lure alone. And so I have this split up by taxa um, where we didn't catch a lot of jewel beetles. Uh, so not a lot of, uh, we couldn't even really run stats on that, but um, for cerambicids, so the longhorn beetles, the bark beetles and all taxa combined, there was a benefit to using pheromone enhanced lure blends, especially this this super lure divine design for beetles um, infesting softwood trees. For experiment two, um, data was a little less, or the results were a little le less obvious. I mean, lure type didn't have an effect on um, species richness of all target taxa combined or of longhorns um, in New Brunswick, but there was a significant effect of lure type where this this reduced component blend here, this MON blend, which I'll call the, the monochamol blend, um, caught more species than the, um, the EZF blend, which I'll refer to as the EZ buscamol blend. Um, and kind of a similar pattern in Poland, no effective lure type in the canopy, but in the understory, we did see the, the monochamol blend um, here performing the best. Okay, so how about the effect of our different lure types on, on mean catch or detection rates of individual species? Um, so while species richness is kind of holistically, we had to run like many, many, you know, 189 analyses per response variable um, to look at detection rates and mean catch for individual species. Um, and the results were really species specific, but you know, in experiment one, it was really clear. So there were 30 different species where lure type was statistically significant. And in 27 of 30, the addition of pheromones improved catcher detection rates. And this just shows you know, two different examples, one longhorn species that was caught in higher numbers um, in the hardwood uh, hardwood super lure and one that was caught in higher numbers in the softwood. So species specific, but generally the addition of pheromones was really important. Uh, for experiment two, the reduced component lure blends, um, lure type was significant in for, for 40 species, but, but really species specific on what was preferred. So 10 species preferred the, the, the KET, which I'll call the Ketol blend, 11 species, the Easy Fuscamol blend, and 15 species, the Monochemal blend. So, you know, definitely, you know, the Monochemal blend may be performing better in terms of species richness, but likely, likely catching a different community of beetles, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, with respect to trap height, um, these Venn diagrams show the number of species caught um, by, by our different taxa, either in the understory or canopy alone or in both strata. Um, so although most species were detected in both strata, about 65% of the jewel beetles or the buprestids and 40% of the cerambicid longhorns and the uh, scolited bark beetles were, um, were actually only caught in one strata, so either the canopy or the understory. Um, in general, canopy traps tended to be better for detecting buprestids and cerambicids and understory traps for scolitids, but again, 
um, really species specific patterns um, across all sites um, and experiments, trap height affected um, mean catch or detection of 57 different species. Um, but yeah, 29 were caught in higher numbers in the understory and whatever this adds up to, 28 in the canopy. So again, these really species specific patterns. So then it becomes important to, to try to um, look at community assemblages that are being caught in these different treatments. Um, and so for that, we relied on our ordinations. So before I discuss the results of these, I just want to take a minute and explain how you interpret these plots, because I know for many of you, um, you may not be, be used to interpreting them. So ordination, we use non-metric multidimensional scaling for the stats nerds out there, um, basically summarizes community data, so such as species um, abundance data, by producing what's called a low dimensional ordination space, in this case, this two dimensional plot, in which similar samples are plotted close together on this plot. Um, and dissimilar samples, or in this case, traps, are far apart. So each one of these little dots here represents the community of beetles that was caught by each trap. Okay. And so when they're close together, they caught similar communities. And when they're far apart, they caught really different communities. Okay, and so this particular plot shows the results for experiment one, and they were remarkably clear. So bark and wood boring beetle assemblages were distinct both by canopy, uh, uh, or rather by trap position, canopy versus understory, and by um, lure type. Okay, so we can see here the canopy traps shown in black, really distinct from understory traps shown in gray in terms of the community of beetles that were caught. Um, but there was differences within uh, within a, a forest stratum level as well. So our softwood super lure did, um, caught a completely different community of beetles than did um, our our traps that were baited with um, the hardwood super lure blend or our most volatile lure. And actually the communities were quite similar, right? So our hardwood super lure um, caught a very similar community of beetles um, to our, our host volatile lures um, that did not include pheromones. And that was consistent in both the canopy and the understory. And, you know, very similar results in experiment two, where we had distinct communities being detected in the understory versus the canopy, but also by lure blend where our monochemal based lures were really distinct in the communities that they caught. Um, whereas the, the ketol reduced component blend and the easy fuscamol reduced component blend, there was lots of overlap. So they're actually catching really similar communities uh, of beetles. And so this is really re um, suggesting to us at this point that it becomes really important in a biosurveillance context to make sure you have traps both at multiple forest strata, so in the canopy and in the understory, um, as well as having multiple lure blends, but specifically lure blends that catch different assemblages of species. And so if we're gonna uh, recommend one of our reduced component blends, we want to make sure that we might use this monochemal blend and either the easy fuscamol blend or the ketol blend, but not both. You don't want to pair these together because they're um, catching the same community. Okay, so warning, the next couple of graphs are a lot to look at, um, but I couldn't help myself. Um, we wanted to, we ran some sample base refractions, which are basically just species accumulation curves showing how many species were detected associated with a certain number of traps um, for our different treatments. And so since funding, you know, operationally is going to limit the number of traps that can be deployed at a given site in an invasive species bio biosurveillance program, knowing the optimum combination of the, the lure type and the trap placement to detect the greatest number of target, target taxa with the lowest trapping effort is really the goal here. And this first set of graphs show the results of the species accumulation curves for our single treatments in experiment one on the left and experiment two on the right. Um, but there's really one big thing I want to point out on this on this graph, which is this bottom line here is is kind of the the, the historical operational standard, these understory traps with eth ethanol. 
you know, very clearly performed, you know, the worst of all our single treatment combinations in experiment one, um, much more overlap um, with experiment two. But these are just single treatment combinations. So, you know, one lure type and one canopy or one stratum uh, or vertical positioning of the trap. But operational use of these traps and lures are not limited to just applying one treatment. And so um, we wanted to evaluate which two treatment combinations were the best in terms of optimizing number of species detected. And so each one of these lines in these species accumulation curves represents a two treatment combination. So for example, in the top left here, this US plus CS is an understory trap with the softwood lure and a canopy trap with the softwood lure. Um, so each line is a two treatment combination. Okay. And so th there are a lot, these graphs are a lot to look at. And I just want to summarize, you know, the really important points to take home, which is that you can see sort of a cluster of lines um that are pretty good in terms of species detection and then a cluster of lines that are that are really poor in terms of the two treatment combinations um, and what we saw is the two treatment across experiments the two treatment combinations that that tend to perform the best were those that included both canopy and understory traps and those that included two different lure blends that catch different assemblages of species so for example from our experiment two lures we would always want to see the monochemal based lure and then one of either the ketol based lure or the easy fuscamol based lure. Okay, so wrapping up, one of the primary goals of this study was to be able to make recommendations to agencies that are operationally engaged in early detection surveys. Um, and they provided significant funding for this work. And so we wanted to be able to make some operational recommendations. So broadly, this study you know, demonstrated that um, diversifying trapping surveys in terms of the lure blends that you use, and in this case, the trapping heights, the vertical positioning is going to be important. Um, but more specifically, this, this particular study demonstrated that hanging traps in both the canopy and the understory is important. Um, Again, what is best in terms of ma maximizing species detections isn't always feasible, but we we also wanted to estimate, you know, the feasibility of this. And so we estimated, you know, it's about two dollars and fifty cents per trap more and only, you know, a few minutes extra per trap between five and eight to, to hang canopy traps versus understory. Um, so, so hopefully operationally feasible and one of my collaborators published a, like a how to guide that, um, that managers can use for installing canopy traps. We also strongly encourage, you know, investing in this, uh, in the pheromone enhanced lure blends, um, especially combinations of blends that attract different species. Um, and of course, new serumbicid pheromones are continually being discovered, um, and so these should be incorporated operationally as research advances. And, and this is this is um, being done currently by Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is kind of our national organization for non-native bark and wood borers. Um, we didn't consider trap color in this experiment, um, but we didn't detect a lot of the jewel beetles or the buprestids in our studies, um, which is not totally surprising because we know they prefer green and purple traps and we know that the lure blends were optimized more for longhorns um, and bark beetles. Um, but considering trap color into these kind of general traps might help detect some buprestids. Um, and then, you know, it's also worth noting that our, you know, based on our rarefaction curve, so here's a rarefaction curve just showing number of species detected across all traps in experiment one. And we didn't, we didn't reach asymptote. So this line didn't start to flatten off completely, which means that additional traps would have continued to catch more species. And since operationally, um, it's usually like four to six traps deployed per site, that's way down here. Okay, so obviously increasing traps is going to increase detections. Um, but at some point, you're going to be operationally limited by the total number of traps to set up and service across the site. And so managers might think about intensifying survey efforts at a given site, so hanging more traps at a given site in a given year with fewer sites in a year, but then rotating these surveys um, among high, six, high risk sites 
um, every two to three years, for example. Um, I didn't say much about our trap trees, but what, um, one of the tools that we also wanted to evaluate was whether we could, you know, have these stress sort of sentinel trees as, a, as another tool for early detection. Um, and so we go in, we girdle trees with a chainsaw in one year and then come back one or two years later, buck up the tree and, and see what comes out of these, um, what we call bolts. Um, and so we actually didn't find a lot of species this way, only 18 across experiments, um, but we did have some species detected using this method that were not detected in traps. So maybe some more work um, on using these trap trees. And then finally, I didn't describe the experiment, but um, our funnel traps, our four funnel traps um, that we evaluated in a different experiment are, are just really not recommended. They perform, these are our rarefaction curves for that study, um, and they performed far, um, they were far, detected fewer species than our 12 funnel traps by far, so, so not recommended. Okay, um, so just to wrap up, in terms of future work, um, we have a lot of data that need to be analyzed and written up. Um, I haven't made much progress in the last year. Um, that's one of the reasons why I also hope to, you know, apply for a sabbatical in the coming years so I can get some of that out. Um, so yeah, some data that needs to be written up, but more generally, more broadly, the chemical ecology of, of Serambicidae, of longhorn wood borers is, is a quickly advancing field. And so um, evaluating advances in the field is gonna be necessary as discoveries occur. Um, but I'm also interested in, in the longer term in continuing to contribute to the evaluation of a relatively new hypothesis called the pheromone free space hypothesis um, that posits that the establishment success of longhorn wood boring beetles in a, in a novel environment might be related to whether or not they encounter what's referred to as pheromone free space. Um, so basically, this hypothesis predicts that um, a non-native species might be more likely to establish in an environment, in a novel environment, if they use pheromone components or sometimes called pheromone channels that are unique from the native species um, in, the, in the habitat that are active at the same time. And so in a 2020 paper that I collaborated on, our results provided some partial support for this hypothesis. Um, but lots of work um, remains to be done. Um, and for those interested, this is one of the timer traps that we used in, in that study and a former McEwen student, Alex Cowett, who worked on that, um, who's now at the University of New Brunswick working on emerald ash borer for his masters. So um, lots of people to acknowledge beyond the, beyond the collaborators I acknowledged earlier, taxonomic expertise, technical and logistic support, field site access, and lots of funding agencies. So um, I'll just leave this here. And so you can all <laughs> digest that while I, um, yeah, while I entertain any questions. So thanks everybody for coming. And hopefully you all were able to <laughs> digest as I sped through that. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, everyone's clapping. They are all on mute, so you 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 can't hear all of the applause as you normally would in a face-to-face -face space. So uh, I would encourage uh, participants to put your questions into the chat, and we have approximately ten minutes uh, for for Q and A. Shall I go get a coffee while you think of some questions? Just kidding. No, the system won't allow you to unmute, but um, one of your colleagues has, um, I think, something that they would like to share. So I have it here, I think, there we go. How likely are the beetles to travel within Canada? Exa example, those ash borers. How likely are they to travel within Canada? Very likely. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question is like, how likely are they to come to Edmonton? <laughs> but. 
Yeah, I mean, they're very likely. Uh, for emerald ash borer, for example, I mean, it's the, the main vector once they're here is, is firewood. So, you know, burn what you buy. You don't, don't move firewood around. That's like one of the big public awareness campaigns that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has been promoting because it's, you know, when, when you get campers from maybe some people from Winnipeg wanting to come camp in the mountains or wanting to come camp here in Alberta and they bring their firewood from home, that that can often be problematic. Um, and so, yeah, that moving firewood is one of the big problems um, with, with bark and wood borers once they, once they have arrived. Um, yeah, so on their own, they could still spread, but it's less likely, especially for something like emerald ash borer where like in the prairies, um, we don't have native ash forests. So they're not, they're not really going to be able to kind of stepwise make their way. And so it's going to be likely by a, you know, a, a long distance dispersal event aided by humans by moving something like firewood or in contaminated, um, you know, potentially wood packaging material, you know, arriving by rail or, or, um, or otherwise. But that depends a bit by species and and some yeah it, in terms of how far they can disperse on their own versus aided by humans. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions we have. Thank you for the presentation. Very insightful. Where do we submit pictures of a new species beetle if we should encounter a diverse beetle? So. Yeah, I mean, good question. So if you it like if you suspect that you might have a non native species, there are there are typically both um, like provincial as well as like national. There's sometimes like tip lines. So I know the Alberta government has has one. Um, there's a website where you can go in and um, and indicate, I don't know if you can upload the photo or how it works, but there's definitely a few different ways you can do that. Um, oftentimes what people do is send it to somebody like me or, you know, they'll find somebody local who can identify the species. Because if you, like, if you found a beetle, you know, like on your tree or something and you're, you're concerned that it might be a non-native species or a pest species, oftentimes, um, you know, uploading it to, to some, um, like apps like you know iNaturalist for example can be helpful or you can even bring it into like local entomologists you know for working for the provincial government or or for you know natural resources Canada for example but I also get some that land on my desk as well and I have I have since I was a PhD student so so if you have something <laughs> send a picture but specimen is better because pictures are tough or to Kevin Judge maybe to Kevin Judge first <laughs> Thank you. I have another question here. How does your research inform climate change? How does my research inform climate change? I'm not sure that it that this particular project is, um, you know, may, maybe directly addressing it, but um, certainly, you know, invasive invasion ecology in general, you know, has a climate change context because the the ranges at which species can, non-native species can exist at are changing. So um, for example, you know, the climate here in Edmonton has um, become more suitable for, for different groups of species over time based on the changing climate. Um, but I'd say, yeah, it's, it's a bit indirect. <laughs> Thank yous in the chat. As we wait for um, some more questions that might be coming, Lee, I have a question, kind of a broad question for you. I'm really interested in um, what you, your why be behind this project, um, or why this was something that you thought was really important to to study. Um, so I will admit that, like. Um, I, I may have been trying to jam a square peg into a round hole in terms of the resilience and recovery, but certainly being, um, you know, as a society, being able to be resilient to the non-native, you know, introductions of non-native species is important. Um, 
so the why in the context of this presentation maybe but you know more broadly um th this problem of non-native species and their impact you know financially ecologically you know socially uh, it is only going to get worse and um and we can't prevent them entirely and so our our you know, our next best option is to detect them early and to respond. And so, yeah, so early detection is um, is just so critical to managing that, um, yeah, that it makes it um, both interesting and um, and um, useful in an applied context as well. Thank you. Great talk. With the four funnel Lindgren trap, why do you believe it's not as effective? Is it yeah. just less likely that the beetle will, sorry, is it just less likely that the beetle will encounter the trap? Yeah, so great question. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that since I have time now. Um, so that trap was something that um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, one of our funders, like specifically wanted us to look at because They've had some problems with vandalization of traps, right? Because they're often in urban areas. Um, and yeah, they're vandalized in very creative ways sometimes. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the four funnel traps, they're cheaper, they're easier to handle, and they could actually be just with like a little hook on a stick be placed out of the reach of vandals, like still kind of understory, but higher than the 12 funnels. Uh, and they're cheaper. And so so that's why we wanted to look at them because maybe if they were a good option, it was gonna, you know, just help kind of the feasibility. Um, the reason that they didn't perform well um, is probably twofold. First, just surface area, right? Because these beetles are, you know, they're flying towards the lure. They smell something, they're flying towards it, and they basically just hit it and fall in. And so just the, you know, sheer fact that there's a smaller surface area is likely gonna be a factor, but um, there could also be some a visual cue component. So the larger, the longer 12 funnel is a just a more obvious visual cue of that silhouette that looks like a tree trunk. Um, and so that could have played a role as well. We have time for probably one or two more questions. How often would you check the traps to monitor the amount? Yeah, thanks. Um, so for the, the main study that I showed you is every two weeks, um, we would have to go in. So the traps, I didn't give you a lot of detail, but they have a little collection cup at the bottom that's filled with a saturated water and salt solution um, and some, uh, some dish soap to break surface tension and the beetles fall in instead of being able to like walk on water. Um, and so, yeah, we check that every two weeks and bring those back to the lab and kind of re reset up the traps with, with fresh water. Um, sometimes if there was a lot of rain, we, we would have a problem where the trap would be overflowing, um, or there'd be like down traps. It happens, branches break or whatever. Um, there was, um, yeah, so so we'd sometimes have to like throw out data from a two week period because if you can't be certain that it um, that it yeah, that it um, was up and running. Um, but yeah, every two weeks we'd have to service them. Um, the timer trap that I showed you at the end, which was um, used in connection with the evaluating that pheromone free space hypothesis, we needed to get an idea of the daily activity patterns of beetles. Um, and we'd still actually we check that one every week, but um, it's really cool because you could program it such that I think there was eight bottles. Um, and so you could program it so that like bottle one always collected beetles between like plus or minus 30 minutes from sunrise. And then it would rotate on its own throughout the day within, let's say, a week long period. And so everything in bottle one would be, you know, between six and seven a.m., everything in bottle two at a different time and so on. So that one, 
um, yeah, it was a little different and allowed us to, to incorporate kind of daily um, activity patterns as well as the seasonal activity patterns that we're, that we're able to get with our kind of regular traps. Okay, so our time is almost coming to a close. I have one more if you could briefly comment on, on this one, Leah. I kind of get the idea of how the trap combinations increase the likelihood of detecting species. But is there any way of estimating the chances that we're missing species? Just wondering about monitoring for specific species. Can we know we're doing the minimum to detect a particular invasive? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. So yeah, we can, we know that we are missing species. That, and that's what our species accumulation curves tell, tell us, the ones where we have like traps on the x-axis and um, I could maybe go back and uh, number of species on the y-axis. Sorry, uh, I can't, I, I can't do it right now. But, um, and so when that curve doesn't re reach asymptote, when it doesn't flatten off, I mean, we know we're missing species because more traps would have caught more species. Um, and so those are likely species that are rare at a site. And those are, you know, rare, low density. That's how non-natives exist, at least initially. So, um, so yes, you can, you can tell if you're missing species and, and we know that we were. Um, so, and then your question asked about like individual species. So for example, there might be a particular species that we're concerned about um, because it has the potential to be a really bad invader. And so, and that's absolutely true. And I would say that that there's kind of a different approach. And so this this research is really for like quite general traps that can be used operationally to kind of monitor like a broad array of of bark and wood boring beetles. Um, and so we wanted to optimize, you know, like species richness per trap. But there are definitely particular species that we know are attracted to specific lure blends and specific kinds of traps like emerald ash borer wouldn't be, you know, the trap, these traps wouldn't be great for them or emerald ash borer. So instead, when there's a really high risk species like emerald ash borer, there'll be species specific research specific to that. And that would have to be used sort of in combination as well um, so that you didn't miss that particular high risk species. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Flaherty, for this fabulous presentation. I appreciate um, all of your insight and thank you to all everyone who's come to join us this afternoon. Yeah, so thank you care, all for coming. Stay safe. <laughs> okay, bye everybody.